Ken Clark had cause to reflect uh, once that he had a new hobby in life, and that was to fight and lose conservative leadership contests. And indeed, there was an extraordinary sequence in his career where he fought three of them uh, in the space of eight years after the 1997 election, and he lost the lot. Um, so indeed, it was a new hobby. And yet, he still qualifies as a prime minister we never had for several reasons. One of them being the wider context, indeed, of those contests that he fought and lost. In number 10, and it was Tony Blair's number 10 when all these Tory leadership contests were fought, they had a similar discussion at each one, 97, 2001 and uh, 2005, uh, they looked at the candidates and the one they feared most was Clark. Uh, and there was good reason for that, that opinion polls at the time of each of those contests suggested that amongst voters at large, he was the most popular. And when people analysed the plight of the Conservative Party during this period, they often wondered and reflected on whether Ken Clark, this popular, ebullient, extrovert figure, could have saved them more quickly than it took. But he lost all of them. There are other reasons why he qualifies as a prime minister we never had. And some of them are, in some respects, counterintuitive to the way he's perceived. He was uh, an extraordinarily well-qualified prime minister we never had. Uh, one of the most well-qualified uh, in the series of prime ministers we never had that we're looking at uh, in the series. And that is because of the extraordinary range of ministerial offices that he held. He was in there for a long period of the Thatcher era, and he held all the big jobs except foreign secretary. He was interested in foreign affairs, but he didn't get that one. But he was a reforming education secretary, a reforming health secretary, and a radical home secretary. And he then became a chancellor uh, in a period of great political turbulence, the John Major era, and he guided the economy to a relatively stable place by 1997. Didn't help them win the next election, but the economy was in pretty good shape. And that is a formidable range of ministerial qualifications. It is interesting. When you think of some of the prime ministers we've had, David Cameron, Tony Blair, get into number 10 with no ministerial experience, here was someone more than ready in that respect. And there was a particular reason why he was seen as a potential prime minister, or indeed could have been, if he presented himself in a slightly different way. And that is this. Contrary to his image as someone on the Tory left, he was in some ways a reformer that chimed with the sort of Thatcherite beat of his party, although he would never describe himself as a Thatcherite and in some ways wasn't obviously over Europe, but other issues too. But if you look back at his ministerial career and divorce yourself from the ebullient, attractive personality, he could be a dry, determined reformer. When he was education secretary, he briefed very openly that he was seeking to introduce grammar schools by the back door, grammar schools by stealth. And Margaret Thatcher, who privately was a supporter of selection and all the rest of it, was deeply cautious about this. Uh, she, as education secretary, had famously abolished a lot of grammar schools and extended the comprehensive system, not because she believed in it, but because she had, again against caricature, a pragmatic streak. He was ready to do it. Grammar schools by stealth. Then, as health secretary, he was the one who established the framing of the term reform in public services. It was he, as health secretary, who introduced a degree of internal competition, 
and internal markets that became the model for Tony Blair and David Cameron. When they looked to reform the NHS, they looked back and began, they changed it, but began with the Clark reforms. And again, it was not Thatcher pushing this, but Clark. It became known as Thatcherite reforms in public services. She was cautious. She said to him, look, why, maybe we should introduce an, a new national insurance increase to pay for the NHS. He said we can make it more efficient through these reforms. And he prevailed. Another characteristic of him is this determination uh, to prevail, to be unyielding. And he was, as a policymaker in those departments, he was in his candour in that famous period that spanned the dramatic and fast fall of Margaret Thatcher. On that famous night, after battle one of the leadership contest in the autumn of 1990, when she had one-to-ones with cabinet ministers, he, Clark, was famously one of the more brutal in his candour about the fragility of her position in a way that she found devastating, but he found necessary. And he did it because he was, as they said of him, a big beast. He wasn't going to flounder and waffle, he told her brutally. And in this, you can see the characteristics of leadership forming. A reforming minister determined to prevail, a brave enough public figure to tell your leader and prime minister your time is up. And then he became chancellor. And again, somewhat against caricature, he was uh, an orthodox chancellor. He was wary of public spending increases at a time when public services, in some cases, were pretty close to being on their knees. He was very strict when those public spending rounds came round. He was also, and this was an era, of course, it was the last era, when chancellors were in control of interest rates. And rather like Roy Jenkins, when Jenkins was Chancellor under the Harold Wilson Labour government um, in the 60s. Uh, Ken Clark was very prudent, to use a Gordon Brown term, when it came to interest rate decisions. Even in the lead-up to that 1997 election, when it might have been the instinct of a more reckless Chancellor, um, he didn't cut interest rates drastically. Uh, Tony Blair and others expected him to, and he never did. Uh, and Roy Jenkins was similarly rigid in economic policy making up until the 1970 election. Both got credit for their rigidity, but their parties lost elections subsequently. There is an argument that Ken Clark was too prudent with public spending. For example, John Major's Citizens charter which he made much of in which public services were meant to be absolutely for the citizens and citizens would have the right of redress when public services didn't come up to scratch it was much harder to make sense of when public services were underfunded as i think most conservatives now accept they were in that period but he was a tough chancellor and in some ways as i say in terms of economics Thatcherite, in ways that would have, under different circumstances, delighted his party. And in some respects, he was the star of that John Major government. Whenever there was speculation about Major's fragility, and the speculation was intense for much of the period Major was Prime Minister, Ken Clark, the then Chancellor, was talked of as a possible successor. And when Ken Clark sensed Major was in deep trouble. He said in his party conference speech, um, he was a mighty chancellor, any enemy of John Major is an enemy of mine. And this theatrical demonstration of loyalty was interpreted in some quarters as the exact opposite. Uh, that he was showing his own great strength to such an extent it was almost patronising to the fragile John Major. For what it's worth, I think he meant it. I don't think Ken Clark at any 
point seriously contemplated challenging John Major when on many issues they actually agreed. So there we have a Chancellor perceived to have been successful and there has been much talk since that Labour inherited a pretty buoyant economy in 1997. As I say, there was an important proviso in this. They inherited an economy where public spending urgently needed to go up. Uh, but nonetheless, compared to some legacies, it wasn't a bad one. And he had had all these other posts. And in some respects, he reformed and changed policy in a way that should have delighted the party faithful. Which, of course, raises a very, very big question. Why didn't it? Why did he not become a prime minister or at least leader of his party? Because he had one other qualification as well, before I answer the question. And that is this, that in terms of performance, I think Ken Clark was the first of a new breed of politicians. And that is the one who discovered the art of the political interview. He was part of an era where big party rallies were in decline, although he was quite a good speech uh, deliverer. Um, but the political interview was becoming the most important stage for a politician. And Clark was a brilliant interviewee. He was candid, funny, tough uh, and endearing. And I can't remember a political interview, even when he said things that were apparently embarrassing to himself, like he hadn't read the Maastricht Treaty or he hadn't read the Conservative Manifesto in 2017 or whatever. I can't remember one where at the end it did not appear as if he was emerging from the studio triumphant. And it was a fantastic base for Clark. To give you one example, when he was Home Secretary in the early part of the major era, the Chancellor was Norman Lamont. It was well known that uh, Ken Clark wanted the Chancellorship and Norman Lamont was in trouble because we had left the exchange rate mechanism, everything was wobbly. And Norman Lamont, although actually I think a rather good interviewee, was scared to go near a studio in that period. So quite often on programmes like today, you would hear the following introduction. Interest rates are soaring, unemployment is going up. Here to discuss what's going wrong is the Home Secretary, Ken Clark. He leapt onto any platform to talk about the economy, in a way that was basically an unsubtle application for the top, not the top job, the chancellorship that he wanted. And he got it. He replaced Norman Lamont. And I think now a necessary part of a leader's repertoire is to be able to perform effectively in the forum of the interview. And he could and has flourished in that forum ever since. Which again raises the question, why didn't he get it? And the answer, of course, as is often the case with the Prime Ministers we never had, is that strengths, in some respects, can be weaknesses in others. He was so resolute that he was not going to change his views on the issue that divided his party, Europe. And in this sense, there is another echo with Roy Jenkins, another Prime Minister we never had. When Roy Jenkins voted for Britain's membership of the then common market uh, in the early 1970s against the leadership of his party, Roy Jenkins gave up any hope, realistically, of ever becoming leader of that party. Europe drove him above everything else. And it has been the same with Ken Clark. And it shows that policy and differences with others over policy matter more than anything else when it comes to deciding who will lead a party. This is something I think Ke uh, David Cameron underestimated when he held his referendum. Friendship means nothing when there are differences over policy. Ken Clark, in that 
major cabinet was close to the likes of Michael Howard and Norman Lamont. They were all at Cambridge together. They were known as the Cambridge Mafia. But they disagreed over Europe. Already Lamont and Michael Howard were becoming intense Eurosceptics and Clark was a passionate pro-European. And the internal battles in that major government defined him more than anything else. All the other things I've mentioned were sideshows. For example, there was a massive divide in the major cabinet over whether John Major should offer a referendum on Britain joining the euro, the single currency. It seems like ancient history now. But that battle was as intense as what form Britain should have some kind of relationship with the European Union after Brexit in the May cabinet. And Clark held out for a long time in his conversations with John Major, insisting that it would be madness to offer a referendum on an issue as complex as membership of the single currency, and that with the British media being what it was, very, very difficult for a government to win. In the end, he conceded, somewhat out of character, but he came to recognise that without that offer, this Conservative parliamentary party might fall apart. The reason I say there are lessons in all of this for David Cameron is I think David Cameron had an overstated faith that friendship would determine the way some of his cabinet colleagues would uh, a campaign in his Brexit referendum. He thought the fact that he was mates with Michael Gove would be more important than Gove's convictions, which were in favour of Brexit. Friendship is not the overriding factor in politics. It's uh, what people believe in the fundamental policy areas. And as I say, that major cabinet was full of friends and they were fighting a civil war over Europe. And Clark, along with Michael Heseltine, about probably the same level of intensity, were the pro-Europeans. And when that government collapsed in 1997, slaughtered in the New Labour landslide, Clark was one of those left standing. There weren't that many. His main foe in the cabinet, Michael Portillo, had lost his seat. Michael Heseltine was still recovering somewhat from his heart attack, but there he was. And to give him credit, it didn't cross his mind to leave politics. Uh, there are some in this modern era of politics that the moment they are out of a cabinet, they, they leave and do other things. He is a political addict and he was there to fight and most particularly to fight leadership contests. But this is another lesson of leadership or an inability to win a leadership contest. A lot of people asked during this mad phase between 1997 and 2005 when he fought and lost three contests, what's wrong with the Conservative Party? Why aren't they electing this popular figure who um, could communicate and, uh, in a way that voters respond to? And the answer is they disagreed with him on Europe. And you cannot have a leader at odds with a party. There is a neat symmetry between party and leader. When Labour elected Tony Blair in 1994, it was a sign that they were willing to compromise on a whole range of issues in order to win. It showed that they were ready to win. In 1997, the ideological battle over Europe in the Conservative Party was only just beginning. So Ken Clark fought that contest. Some of his allies said, look, for goodness sake, just trim on Europe, and he couldn't. And in a way, it's greatly to his credit that he didn't. He made it absolutely clear that he was in favour of the single currency, he was a passionate pro-European and so on. And he didn't have a hope of winning, even though every poll, remember they had been slaughtered and they were desperate to work out a way back, every poll showed he was the most popular in the country, but he didn't win. And if by some freakish chance that 
had happened, it is very difficult to see how Ken Clark could have led them. There were other odd moments during this period. In one of his leadership contests, when it was clear he couldn't win on his own, he formed a wacky alliance with John Redwood, the passionate Eurosceptic. And again, this was a symptom of great unease within a party that you could have two serious, absolutely internally opposed figures standing on the same leadership ticket. It didn't get anywhere. It was absurd and they sort of knew it. Uh, but that was his attempt at expediency and it jarred because he can't do expediency. He can only say what he thinks and do what he thinks. And in the third contest, again, it was Europe. One of the attacks on David Cameron is that he claimed to be a moderniser but didn't take his party on over Europe, the issue that had actually tormented it for decades. And in fairness to Cameron, you can sort of see why. Because again, there was Ken Clark fighting that leadership contest. Again, some of his supporters saying, please trim over Europe and then you might win it. But he couldn't. And Cameron merely kept his message to his party on Europe. We must stop banging on about it quite so much. In other words, we don't need to change our approach, just talk about it less. That isn't really challenging it. But he, Ken Clark, once again, tried to put the case for Europe, said he couldn't change, and he lost again. So there are, I think, from this very long political journey, quite a few lessons about leadership. One of them is this, and it's difficult to say because it's not necessarily admirable. It is arguably more admirable for Ken Clark to stick to his principles and not yield. But party leaders tend to be pragmatists. They are willing to twist and turn to get the leadership and then keep their party together, not least on Europe. Um, each of our actual prime ministers, not the ones we never had, but the actual ones, twist and turn on Europe. Theresa May is being attacked for her op opaque approach to Europe and Brexit. She's absolutely in a pattern of leaders and prime ministers. Tony Blair, who was a pro-European, but in that single currency debate leading up to 97 and beyond, managed to both support and oppose the single currency. His policy really wasn't very different to John Major's and yet he could slaughter John Major whilst himself keeping all options open. Margaret Thatcher, this supposedly strong, hostile European Prime Minister, signed every treaty and succumbed to joining the exchange rate mechanism when her senior ministers told her to. So even those prime ministers with landslides or leaders of opposition with big opinion poll leads twist and turn over this issue that has divided Britain and British politics and their parties for decades. Ken Clark couldn't. And it's one reason why he didn't become prime minister. Another is that sometimes ebullience and a wonderfully enviable public profile in some respects can produce awareness amongst party members. Party members tend to respond most to those who are hardworking and a little dull, um, who convey a total reliability. So when Ken Clark would pop off to Ronnie Scott's after a late night at the Treasury and enjoy a few hours of cigar smoking and jazz. It was greatly appealing to a British electorate to view politicians largely as unattractive machines. But party members don't necessarily think, oh, isn't that great? They sometimes think, why isn't he working around the clock in the Treasury and so on? And so, again, one of his great strengths, this zest for life and pleasure and ebullience, perhaps again like Roy Jenkins, 
becomes to some extent a disqualification for leadership. But in a way like, again, Jenkins actually, and not all our prime ministers we never had, I think Clark has shown that it's not necessarily needed to get into number 10 to make an historic impact. Arguably, as I say, his record as a minister and those reforms that he introduced, good or bad, um, were of historic significance and had echoes in future administrations who followed them up. But above all on Europe, he continued to make a significant contribution. He was one of the few Conservative MPs on the back benches who continued to put a robust case against Brexit. He does so with total self-confidence because, unlike so many MPs, scared of defying the outcome of the referendum, he is brutally candid again. He says he doesn't approve of referendums. It was an opinion poll on one day. And that very candour frees him to speak wholly candidly that his view that Brexit will be a disaster. And one of his many speeches from the back benches on Brexit got one of those rare things in the House of Commons, a round of applause, as he passionately put the case against leaving the European Union one more time. He'll do it many more times to become because, in a way, both his addiction to politics and his passion for Europe means he is as committed a politician now on the back benches as he was when he was described as the big beast who might be required to take over from John Major as Prime Minister and when he fought all those leadership contests. Unlike some who disappear from politics, he is like those from an earlier era, the Dennis Healy's and others who stayed on when Labour were defeated in 79 and continue to have an impact. He continues to do so now. And there's no doubt at all his decision to fight the 2017 election when he was not in particularly good health was to do with this issue of Europe. Europe prevented him from becoming leader of his party and therefore Prime Minister. He became increasingly at odds with his party over the issue. But Europe continued to give a Prime Minister we never had a role and a purpose. And it may be, as the Brexit drama reaches new stages, it will be another historic contribution to British politics.